Welcome to another edition of Zeek in Action. I am your host, Richard Baitlick, and in this series of videos, we try to demonstrate different ways to use the Zeek network security monitoring suite to better understand what's happening on your network. In previous videos, I've taken a close look at data that Zeek produces, as well as data associated with tools like Suricata, or how data um, in the form of network captures might be rendered in a tool like Wireshark or the Brim um, or even with the try.zeek.org website. But I realized that if you are trying to deploy Zeek into your environment, you probably have a question around where should I put my sensor? And that's the topic I'm going to try to address in today's video. Uh, before I talk about that, I wanted to point uh, anyone who's interested towards a blog post I wrote for Corelight called Enabling Soho Network Security Monitoring. Uh, this is the type of information that you might need if you're deploying to an environment that looks something like this where you have a single box that was created or that was delivered to you by your ISP and it has both a four port switch on the back usually and it has a built-in wireless access point. Um, if you're interested in understanding how to instrument that in, uh, environment, I suggest taking a look at this blog post. Just take a look, uh, just Google for enabling Soho network security monitoring or just go to corelight.blog and you'll find it. Um, here though, I'm gonna go into the slightly more complicated topic of dealing with an enterprise environment. And when I talk about an enterprise environment, I'm using, in this case, a, a, a simplification of an enterprise environment. Um, these are images that I built for my book, The Practice of Network Security Monitoring, which came out in 2013. So if you want more details, take a look at chapter two of that book. It'll, it'll talk about this, this same topic as well. But if you want to have some type of discussion about an enterprise, I like to begin with something that has what I would consider to be the classic elements of a physical on-premise environment. We're not going to be talking about instrumenting the cloud or that sort of environment today. This is for someone who has a physical location and they're trying to figure out where they should put their network sensor. Uh, I'm not going to talk about taps or span ports a whole lot. Um, just keep in mind though that there are different physical mechanisms by which you can get access to network traffic. You can either leverage a feature on one of your enterprise class switches, such as a span port, or you can introduce another piece of hardware, uh, such as a network tap. So either one of those will work in this environment, but I, and I'll talk a little bit as we go along. Now, this is probably the simplest sort of enterprise network that I could devise that captures all of the relevant information we're gonna need to discuss this topic. So when you take a look at this network, you have the internet somewhere, you have an access router that connects yourself to the internet. I have a switch here. Then I have some type of gateway or firewall. And attached to that gateway or firewall, we have three segments. On the left here, we have a wireless network with a switch and a wireless access point. On the right, we have a so-called demilitarized zone network lying between the internal and the external network that has a switch of its own. And then on the inside, we have what's labeled the internal network, which has a switch. Now, there are as many variations on this as there are people, well, there's way more people, there's way more variations of this than there are uh, people watching this webinar, I'm sure. Um, but uh, this will give us something to work with, and it will introduce some of the common considerations you have to, uh, you have to meet in order to accomplish your goal of, of instrumenting your, your environment. Um, here I've labeled all of these these systems. Um, note that the internal network can be exceptionally complicated, and I'll address it uh, slightly at the end. Um, but uh, for the most part, we're going to be spending more time on this uh, outer environment here. But I believe that simply by watching this video, you're going to start to get the idea of the, some of the challenges we have when we're trying to instrument uh, an environment. Oh, and the uh, NSM platform will be designated by this little uh, probe symbol here from uh, Cisco terminology. What I'd like to do is give you a sense of some of the traffic flows that you'll encounter, because the way the traffic flows will um, 
help guide your instrumentation decision. So the first type of traffic flow we're going to talk about is a workstation on the internal network. What does it look like when it needs to communicate with the outside world? So say with a web server on the internet. Well, it'll make some type of request that passes through the switch and the gateway, the external switch and the router before it hits the internet and goes through all the devices, middle boxes, etc. that are between the workstation and the web server. And then the reply will come back this way. Now, of course, there, I'm sure there's some of you out there saying, well, what about asymmetric routing? Yes, these are all issues that you will encounter at a something beyond a 101 level that uh, I'm presenting in this, this uh, set of slides here. But that is the first traffic pattern we have to consider is an internal system making a request of a service that is out on the internet uh, and they re the reply coming back. Now, another type of traffic pattern that you could encounter uh, occurs when you have, say, a laptop on the wireless network. Here you have the request that is going through the wireless access point, through the switch, firewall slash gateway, and so forth back out to the web server and the return path. Now, this may seem obvious, and perhaps it is obvious when displayed in such a manner, but it's going to have big consequences when we start to figure out what the goals are for our monitoring program. Let's look at another traffic pattern. Now, uh, in this uh, case, we have a system on the DMZ that is making a request of its own. So let's say this is a DNS server that you have deployed in your DMZ. Perhaps you have a system on the internal network that, that connects to the, D, the uh, DNS server, and then the DNS server makes a request. So this is very similar to the traffic pattern we saw from the wireless network, except it's just on the other side. So the DNS server makes the request, goes out to the uh, DNS server out on the internet, and the response comes back. So far, so good. Now, what if we have the inverse of that pattern? Uh, in other words, you have someone who is browsing the web. Uh, perhaps you have a web server that you're providing to the world on your DMZ network. Uh, you have a client somewhere out in the world who wants to connect to it. Well, they'll send their web request in, comes down through the internet, hits the, the web server in the DMZ network, and the reply comes back. So with that, we have essentially you know, a handful of, of traffic patterns that we need to account for when we are trying to determine where to put our sensor. Now, I have labeled potential locations with letters here, A through what, I. Um, that's quite a few places where you could potentially put a sensor. And the question is, where, where are you going to go? Do you need to instrument all of them? Is there one place that will take care of it? Are there a handful of places that will take care of it? Well, these are the questions we need to answer. Now, before we answer that question, we need to realize that uh, network addressing is going to play a role here. Now, the reason why network addressing is so important is that when you're doing any type of incident detection and response, you want to find out what systems are affected. You want to find out, is your system compromised, and uh, how can I use its IP address in order to examine my logs and find out what's going on. Now, we have all these different segments here on this network. It's possible they could be addressed differently, but I've addressed them here in slightly uh, obvious different RFC 1918 address uh, spaces to make it uh, abundantly clear we're dealing with network address, uh, different address uh, blocks. So for your internal network, we have the classic 10.0 slash 8 network. For the um, wireless network, we're using the 172.16 slash 12 network. And then finally, over in the DMZ network, uh, I'm using a 192.168.2 uh, network. Now, um, notice that I have a, a fourth private network here between the firewall and the external router that goes out to the internet. The router here has to have a public IP address, otherwise no one on the internet will know how to communicate with it and my system won't know how to communicate with anybody on the internet either. So I've, I'm using this uh, 198.51.100.0 uh, class C address space. I can't remember if that is used as example.com or whatever, but let's, th that looks um, uh, external enough to make the point, I believe. So essentially we've got four different addresses or address spaces here that we have to account for that uh, could be used by systems that are connected to these various locations. Um, 
let me go to the next slide and give you some examples of what that might look like. So, for example, um, the gateway here in the middle of all of this, each one of these four interfaces is going to have a unique IP address in order to communicate with its sub-segment. So, for example, the internal address here uh, that's going to connect to the 10 network, maybe that's 10.0.0.6. And the interface here that's connecting to the DMZ, maybe that's 192.168.2.5. And over here, talking to this 172 network, you see the IP address there. And the IP address here that is connecting to this side of the um, uh, edge router is using a 192.168.1.3 address. Uh, similarly, the in internal address of the edge router is 192.168.1.2. And the interface that goes out to the internet for that router is 198.51.100.1. Uh, I hope at this point you're starting to get an idea of why something that is so simple, this network that only has, you know, essentially three legs to it and then one going out to the internet, why suddenly just trying to figure out who is talking to whom can be so difficult. Uh, now, uh, you might say, well, this is all the fault of network address translation, because if we weren't using any network address translation, then, and, th and the network address translation is being done here um, by this external router, because it has a public address on the outside, and it uses a private address on the inside, and the rest of these addresses that are inside here are all private addresses. Um, if there weren't network address translation, we could get rid of that dirty hack, uh, it would be a lot easier. Um, that's true to a certain extent. You know, if you had uh, enough uh, RFC or, or if you had enough IPv4 or now IPv6 addresses, um, you could potentially have everything w uh, using a public address, and that would make uh, a little bit easier for you to figure out what's going on. Um, but we come from a, a land of the legacy networks where uh, NAT has has been a wildly successful technology, and it was successful because it solved two problems. The first was that people didn't have enough RFs, or, or enough uh, IPv4 IP addresses. And secondly, there is a, a security through obscurity function here. And of course, there's a whole bunch of people out there who are saying security, you know, obscurity can't provide security, but guess what? It pl provides pl preventy, uh, plenty of security in the real world as well as in the cyber world. Um, the, the fact that your router is providing uh, NAT is probably the single uh, most effective security mechanism to keep people on the outside from connecting directly to your systems uh, on the internet. Um, that basically eliminated a whole, a whole host of server-side attack patterns um, that just don't exist or, or are extremely difficult to pull off unless you've got port forwarding set up. Um, now, of course, there all the client-side attack patterns are still there, uh, but we're not going to get into a whole discussion about attack patterns at this point. Um, suffice it to say that if you're going to figure out where to put your sensor, you have to take into account all of this different addressing when you make your decision. Okay, so here's uh, some examples of systems that may exist on these networks that you have to take uh, into account. So for example, uh, on the DMZ network, maybe your web server has a true uh, private IP address of 192.168.2.100. And when that system is uh, communicating out to the world, its IP address is actually going to uh, look different. And the reason is that it depends on the vantage point of, of the person doing the watching. So for example, if you're um, out here on the internet and you wanna to connect to the web server, um, potentially you could be advertising uh, 192, or sorry, 198.51.100.100 to, um, to the world as the say via DNS as the IP address of this web server, but then as that address is reached by each of the components here, that gets translated via NAT to the IP address of the um, you know the real IP address of the web server, the private IP address of the web server that it's it's sitting there listening. Uh, similarly, you could have an issue um, with this uh, laptop, right? This laptop could have 172.16.1.50 address. Um, but at each point, as it is talking to the outside world, that IP address is being natted uh, along the way. And someone who is out on the internet, who is looking at a connection uh, coming inbound from this device, it's going to see it perhaps coming from 198.51.100.1, which, as we remember, is the IP address of this external router. And because uh, NAT is being performed, 
we've got that going. Now, uh, I just noticed here, we actually have two levels of NAT happening here, which is something that occurs in, in many networks. Uh, and I think we had a pr uh, double NAT in the previous slide as well that I didn't mention at that time. But here you can see that um, I've got this, this gateway slash router slash firewall device doing its own layer of NAT. So it's doing a NAT of this uh, laptop 172.16.1.50, translating it to 192.168.1.3, which is its uh, IP address out here. And then that's getting uh, NATed again by this external device. So you've got a double NAT situation. Um, it all just works, but it can make your life a little bit more difficult if you're trying to figure out exactly what IP address is doing what in your Zeke logs. Okay, so uh, if you looked really quickly, you saw the answer to the question. So I'm going to stop here before I decide uh, where should you monitor. In fact, we could just go back here to the uh, different slide that has the uh, ABCDG and so forth. The question is, where do you put your Zeek sensor in order to uh, get the best bang for your buck out of your Zeek logs? Now, it comes back to what is the, what is the goal of your monitoring program? Uh, personally, if at all possible, my goal is to see the true source IP address of any suspicious or malicious activity and to see the true destination of any uh, suspicious or malicious activity. So if you're dealing with a compromised client, I want to be able to see that 10 dot whatever IP address or that 172.16 dot IP address. Or if I'm trying to figure out something in my DMZ network, I want to figure out which 192.168.2 slash 24 addresses in, in use. It doesn't help me to know that uh, 198.51.100.1 was compromised. In other words, if I was sitting out here at point E and uh, essentially I'm seeing more or less traffic always using the external IP address or potentially a few of the mapped IP addresses such as, as, the, as the web server, that actually might work because if I know if I have, say, uh, a static one-to-one -one mapping. Um, let's see. If I know that all traffic to 198.51.100.100 is always mapped to this system, then yeah, potentially I could sit out here and see traffic involving this IP address. Supposedly, assuming all the natting is working and port, port forwarding is working appropriately, uh, then yes, I know I'm talking about the web server over here. But if I'm only seeing traffic involving 198.51.100.1, that could be anything from the internal network, or it could be anything from the wireless network, or it could potentially be another system that was plugged into the DMZ network switch, and there's a NAT being applied here, and also a NAT being applied here, and as a result, I don't really know what system's involved. So what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to see the true source IPs for systems in here that are communicating out to the internet. Now, I mentioned that I want to see the true destination IP as well. Now, that doesn't mean I'll be able to somehow put sensors into adversary infrastructure, but I do want to be able to see um, the IP address that it looks like they're going to, that my systems are talking to on the internet. Um, this may seem kind of silly, like, well, well, of course I should be able to see the systems that uh, I'm talking to, but there are various network architectures where a system that's communicating with the outside world isn't actually communicating with an IP address uh, that's used by the outside world. Perhaps everything is proxied, and th you know, all the traffic that you see going to the outside world is actually destined for a proxy. Well, that doesn't tell you anything. If you're just doing, say, uh, level three uh, or layer three level monitoring, and all of the destination IPs are to your proxy, and you don't instrument your proxy so that you can see who the proxy is talking to, well, that doesn't help you at all. That's why I bring up this as a, might, might seem to be a fairly obvious point, and yet it's something that lots of people uh, overlook or don't think about, and that's why it's important to, to make these sorts of decisions. So if I had to pick a place or places that would give me the monitoring visibility that I want, to be able to see true internal source IP addresses is really three places. You have to have locations G, B, and H instrumented. The reason why you need G, B, and H all instrumented is that these are the closest locations to the true IP addresses of each one of these segments. Sitting at location G before this layer of NAT is applied will give you the true source IPs from the wireless network. Sitting at B will give you the true source IPs for the internal network, and location H will give you the true source IPs of the DMZ network. For any one of the security patterns where, or traffic patterns, where systems are talking out to the internet. 
So G, B, and H has to be the place to go. This does mean you'll need a sensor or multiple sensors to handle that type of load. Uh, perhaps you could use one sensor for location H, but then you may need a, se a second sensor for G and a third sensor or potentially more than one sensor for B, depending on the load you're talking about. But in terms of the actual locations that you have to be able to, to get access to traffic, you need uh, G, B, and H to be instrumented. Let's look at the alternatives. If you, loc if you sit out here at, at location C, Everything, everything that's coming off of this router is going to have essentially the router's IP address, this IP address out here, um, which isn't going to help you. If you look at location D, you're going to see the same exact thing because between the, uh, locations D and C, you have a layer 2 switch. It's not making any changes, so D and C are essentially the same location. And if you sit out in location E, more or less all the traffic you're going to see is going to have the public IP address of the router. This is essentially the problem we have with people who, who are stuck with um, standard home network locations and they decide to sit outside of their um, internet service provider provided router. They see all of their public IP address and they don't see the IPs for the 30 to 50 to 60 devices that are on their, their home networks. So uh, locations G, B, and H are the, you know, the approved solution for, for this setup. Now, I wanted to briefly mention the issue of internal networks. Uh, what's the story down here about all these laptops, workstations, etc.? Because essentially we're just treating all the traffic that's coming out to the internet as, as the, uh, the question here. If you want to be able to see individual systems talking to each other, now you need to start talking about a span port that is mirroring traffic among the ports that you care or that you care about on the switch, or you need to introduce additional segmentation that has other places where you can watch traffic. And this is where lateral movement and detecting internal traffic probably warrants its own discussion because it becomes a whole nother situation. Um, essentially, there is no easy way to see arbitrary systems talking to each other. Um, there, there are some highly specialized pieces of network equipment like spider switches, um, and such that can be used to enable this, but I've honestly never seen anyone do it uh, to the point where you could arbitrarily say, I want to see this random system in my network, I want to see all the traffic between that system and this other random system on the network. Uh, honestly, it's just too expensive. So you have to end up making decisions that are the best balance between the accessibility you have and the budget you have to throw at your, your monitoring system. So with that, uh, I hope you enjoyed this discussion of where to put a sensor if you're trying to meet certain traffic uh, visibility goals. If you have any comments, please feel free to leave them in the uh, comment section of the video. Uh, if you have any topics that you would like to talk about in a Zeke in Action video, we're always interested in having uh, guest speakers. If you want to do it on your own, feel free to do that. Uh, and then talk to the Zeke project about it. If you'd like to do some type of uh, video where we have an interaction about your Zeke logs, I'm happy to do that as well. Again, um, probably talking to the Zeke project. Uh, and I like to use either the mailing list or Slack. That's a good way to do it. But for now, um, again, this was Richard Balick with the Zeke project. And uh, I wish you all the best hunting for adversaries in your infrastructure. I hope you don't find them. But if you do, I hope you have the Zeke logs you need in order to determine what they've been doing in your environment, how long they've been there, and how best to remove them. Thank you.